Let me take you back to a bit of personal history. When I was enrolled in the third grade at West City Elementary School here in Dumaguete City, I found myself in a pool of pupils who were being divided into two groups, those who would be attending what they called the regular class and those who would be ushered in a pilot program they called FL. That's me in the yellow. How regular was the regular class? I really had no idea. Perhaps they got regular recess food? I'm not sure. But FL meant fast learners under a program of SPED or special education. And we were part of an education experiment where grade school students were taught high school mathematics, high school science, high school humanities, including English. We would have the same teachers from grade three to grade six. And it was hoped that when we finally graduated, we would become exemplars of grade school teaching using secondary school materials. But let me focus this trip down memory lane to one school policy SPED was notorious for. It's English only policy. And my God, we were notorious. Not only did we get exhaustive lessons in the English language for four years running, but we were also taught to converse in the language exclusively. It was so immersive that most of us not only spoke English in the classroom, no, we spoke outside, on the streets, at home. And so if my mother would ask me in the local Binisaya, Yan, ato sa tindahan kay palitog bugas? I would reply in my perfect English, how many kilos of rice do you need, mother? Which weeded her out at first, but she learned to accept it as part of my, I don't know, personality. And along the sidewalks that surrounded our school, there were also several stalls uh, with the various manang selling things like plastic balloon, remember those? And um, Coke in plastic bags and assorted candies. And every time my classmates and I would approach them, we would ask in our perfect English, Ma'am, how much is this candy? And I guess they were amused for the most part, but when they would reply with something like, Tulo peso ni dong, you could imagine the looks of horror on our faces because what exactly did she mean? What is Tulo peso dong? Okay. <laughs> uh, one way with which our teachers enforce the English-only policy is through a game that we later called the badge. Most other schools enforce a specific monetary-based punishment, asking pupils who would speak in the local language to pay 50 centavos or one peso for every word in Binisaya that they would utter. We didn't have that. We had a game. We called it the badge. Okay? A badge could be anything. It could be a bracelet. It's usually a bracelet. Or it could even be a necklace. And it was a thing that, what, that gets to be given to the first person in the class during the school day who would speak in Binisaya. Let's say you, had had, you, you haven't had breakfast because you had to rush to the school for the flag ceremony and you carelessly turn to your nearest classmate and you would say something like, Oops! Your classmate being a tattletale like everyone else in the class would immediately turn to the teacher and say, Teacher, teacher, Ian said something in the dialect. And I'd be given that bracelet, that badge, and I had to carry it for the rest of the day until I'd find someone else in the class who'd speak a word in Binisaya, and I can then gleefully pass on the badge. The last pupil to hold the badge at the end of the school, of the school day gets the ultimate punishment. He or she gets to pay the fine. Uh, so usually, a peso, which was a huge sum in those days, and so we became masters of spying. If I held the badge, I'd have my close friends report to me, anyone who would say something in the local language. And I'd run to the teacher, 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 Regal or Ren said something, said a sentence in the dialect. And we also devised ways for forcing people to inadvertently say something in Binisaya. So for example, we would pinch someone. And when that someone says, Aray or Agui, that's Binisaya. And the badge gets given to them. And for some reason, my class, Mr. Thai, thought that the exclamation, ouch, was also 
binisaya. Don't ask me why. And so when we would pinch someone and they would say, ouch, the badge gets given to them. And so we had to find our way around aray or agoy or the much dreaded ouch. But what is exactly the English equivalent for ouch? For some reason, we in that class sort of agreed that the English equivalent of ouch was, can you guess? I don't think you can guess. Our English equivalent of ouch was ouch. Ouch. Say it after me. Ouch. And so, from grade three to grade six, every time I would hurt myself, I learned to say, ouch. I only started saying ouch when I graduated from grade school and I went to high school in Siliman University and I reclaimed the word for hurting. It all seems funny to me now, but this was how I was introduced to the English language and essentially how I learned to express myself, especially in writing. Because there are many words for the likes of me, and since this is Silliman University, for so many of us here in this venue today, mga Englishero ta, mga spoken in dollars, right? Meaning to say someone who speaks in English most of the time, not just for the ease in communication, but also for creative expression. For example, I write, I have, oh no, <laughs> oops, I have written about six collections of short stories, and truth to tell, I find it so much easier to express myself in the English language. I know its figurative uses, I know its idioms, and I know its literary possibilities. If I were asked to write in Binisaya right now, I'd probably be able to churn out a balak or a sugilanon, but there will always be a feeling deep inside me that chides me that I don't exactly have the appropriate tools to attempt to write in my local language, which is quite ironic. Because this is the language I was born into, and yet we have been made to become estranged towards it, especially in the literary sense. Our writing in English, of course, is an accident of history. In 1898, the Philippines found itself newly colonized by a new world power, the United States, which took to task, as one of its tasks, the colonization, the teaching of American English. For many American administrators at that time, teaching the language was not just about education, no. It was also about pacification. They rightfully surmised that the more the native Filipino learned the language of its new colonial masters, the more they would be susceptible to American ideas. So when the Americans first came to our shores, Okay? They were met with fierce resistance by Filipinos, and not just in terms of armed revolts, but also through the use of culture. We have poems and dramas from that particular period that vehemently decried American excursion to this country. My favorites would be the poem of Al Yankee by Cecilio Apostol and the drama Hindi Ako Patay by Juan Matapang Cruz, which considered the American adventure into the Philippines as a tragedy for Filipinos that could only mean bloodshed. The Filipino-American war that erupted and lasted for at least a decade was also a very bloody affair, which killed almost two million Filipinos. But after the first decade of American rule, resistance invariably went down. And much of that was partly because of the power of the new language, the lingua franca of American English. The link is, I think, easy enough to see. Okay? The more we learn this foreign language, the more we come to think in the cultural ideas that language came from. There are, of course, many advantages gained in using English. To cite a couple of these, some scholars contend that it paved the way for a common ground for discourse in a country that had too many native languages. So, so, so Cebuanos learned to speak English to Ilocanos, Bicolanos learned to speak to Ilongos, all using English. This was prior to the popularity that the Filipino language now enjoys for most of the country. But according to Edna Zapanta Manlapas, oh, go back. According to Edna Zapanta Manlapas, English also leveled the playing field in terms of writing between men and women. Male writers, because of the privilege of their gender, dominated Spanish writing in the Philippines. And with the coming of the Americans, both sexes had to learn English at the same time. By 1905, among the first poets in English, we had somebody named Maria G. Romero, who wrote Our Reasons in Study, which was published in the Filipino Student Magazine. And by the middle of the 1920s, we had our first classic of the short story form, and that is Paz Marquez Benitez, 
who wrote Dead Stars, a story written in English, written by a woman. Okay? The early generations of writers in the Philippines labored understandably in this language. And because of their privileged status, these writings in English came to be considered, if one believed early critics like Father Miguel Bernad, as, a, as the meat of Philippine literature, no matter how inchoate, even though, frankly speaking, it isn't exactly the meat at all. Part of the second generation of writers in English are three writers from Silliman University. We have Ricaredo de Metilio, uh, Edilberto K. Tiempo, Edith Tiempo. Among many others, these three essentially laid the foundation of much of the literary culture we have come to enjoy here in Dumaguete City. And they almost wrote exclusively in English and gained vast renown for their efforts. In Edith Tiempo's case, she later on became National Artist for Literature. What this meant for the most part is that literary expression in the local language in Oriental Negrense Binisaya, which we like to call Binisayang Binuglas, was relegated to the margins, unfostered, unstudied. I'm going to focus more on Negos Oriental in this consideration. I need you to do a quick survey of our schools here, and you will not find a single department of Binisaya language and literature, right? nor do we have academic subjects that aim to study its linguistics or its literariness. We do not have the local anthologies compiling its best writings, although that does not mean we do not have practitioners because there are, but they exist only in the shadows. And in many anthologies that compile Binisaya works that do exist, they make the point of including works of Binisaya writers in Cebu, Bohol, Siquijor, even uh, Northern Mindanao, but rarely from Negros Oriental. Part of the reason of this absence of Binisaya writings in Negros Oriental is essentially because of the widespread influence of Siliman University, an American university, and its vigorous campaigns of English only, especially in the early decades, of championing works written in English. But that's only part of the story. What explains, for the most part, our resistance to express ourselves in our local language. Why do we not see a lot of balaks, a lot of sugilanons, a lot of sugilambongs? I stumbled on a possible answer in one of my Philippine literature classes a few years ago. Once I asked my students what was it about Philippine culture in general that prevented them from really appreciating it. To get to the heart of the matter, I asked them to give their descriptions of it in Binisaya, and little by little, I got their responses. Understandably, what came out was a slew of answers in the negative. And what amused me was the fact that a lot of the words that they gave me actually started with the letter B. They gave me this, Badoy, Bate, Barat, Bugo, Binotbot, Bisaya. These are measures of standards, of course, which delineated for many what was good and what was bad. Badoy most of all. Kabadoy ani oy is a thing we say when we are displeased by something, irked by its lack of quality. But that last word over there really interests me, bisaya. At face value, I got its context for who among us here have not used this word to describe badoy. Let's say a girlfriend shows off her new clothes for you and you don't like it, and then you say, Kabisaya ni moy pag ilis dito. Am I right? But what is bisaya? It is the word we give ourselves as a people, as a culture, as a language. Bisaya is us. Whatever happened along the way that a word we have used to describe ourselves as a people have come to be synonymous with the word badui. How were we brainwashed to think of ourselves as the very synonym of something that is bad? And then I remember the bad system that I had in grade school. While on one hand, I understood the good intentions of this policy, a policy still being enforced by many schools today, I cannot help but think that it has also warped our own relationship with our native language, our native culture, our native sense of self. When we were young, we learn to equate Binisaya with paying a fine, thus invariably molding us to think that Binisaya is bad, hence bad doing. It took me a long time to find my way into literary writing in Binisaya, 
Of late, I have done some sugilanon, but it is the balak form that I am most comfortable with. One thing I particularly love about Binisaya writings is the playfulness they often exhibit, an attitude you can call yaga-yaga, which limbs humor even though the subject matter could be something very, very serious. Like, for example, in Cora Almerino's very popular poem, Unsaon Pagisa sa Banang Amang Hulgas Asawang Dilik Abalong Moloto, which talks about the darkness of domestic abuse but foregrounds it with a funny take on cooking human beings complete with a menu. This yaga yaga attitude could very well be springing from the fact that most of our early balakeros were really men who intoxicated with drinking too much tuba during a tagay session would suddenly wax poetic about any subject under the merry sun or the merry moon. Ako ang kuhaon ng mga mga bitun sa langit o ako ikurunas yung ulo. Oh, something like that. That was exactly the reason why, how I came to write my first balak in Cebuano. I used to have a creative writing teacher from Canada, a woman by the name of Maya, who would take us to El, El Amigo, our favorite drinking place in Dumaguete, where over several bottles of beer, she would teach us the principles and the practice of fiction and poetry. One time, while we prepared to do another writing exercise with her and just beginning to drink our first bottle of beer, Maya told us that she was going to ask her, us to do a particular writing exercise. Maya told us that she was going to ask us to do what she called uh, automatic writing. Okay? We protested vehemently because automatic writing is something we only do for fiction, but she insisted that we do it in poetry. And she said we had to do this in Binisaya. She felt that, that we were not really aware of our language that we need to write in Binisaya. But we were protested because we felt that we had no vocabulary enough to write an entire poem with. But Maya persisted. And so we grudgingly wrote our balak, and at the end of a, of a very quick free writing session, we found ourselves with the first balak that we have ever written, much to our surprise. I didn't know, I actually knew some words, some vocabulary in Binisaya that would actually constitute poetry, but there it was. I actually cannot put down my poem that I wrote a long time ago because frankly, it's very racy. But I've noticed that there were certain words that I used there that absolutely defy the barest interpretation to English. The word lanlan, for example, which in Dumaguete Binisaya is a word you use when you take a spoon and you proceed to eat peanut butter or milk from a bottle in it. Something like that, right? Lanlan in some other places in the Philippines actually means eat, but not in Dumaguete. In Dumaguete, the closest English word for landland is actually lick. But if you think about it, lick is tilap. And you can tilap the floor, but you can never landland the floor, right? <laughs> so, there really is no direct translation of the word in English. And then there's also the other word, uyog, uyog, which means what? Shaking? Bouncing? which is good enough in translation, interpretation, but how unimaginative. If you actually take a look at the Binisaya word itself, uyug, 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 this means something else, uyug, 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 uyug. When you pronounce it with gusto, the word itself shakes and bounces. And this is perhaps the greatest reason why I find there's ultimate fulfillment in learning to write, to express myself in my own language. There's no translation for the direct experience of living here. There can only be an approximation of it in English. Writing in Binisaya is writing that we can breathe in. It is our definition. It is our soul. It does not need translation to get to the heart of who we are. Thank you very much.